I'm really excited to share this message with you this morning. And uh, as I lead into this, I want to tell you about a gift God gave us, Cheryl and I, yesterday. Uh, my niece Amanda lives in Colorado, and hi. And she was just here on a business trip yesterday. And so we got to see her. We don't get to see her very often because obviously, you know, Colorado's not just around the corner from Sacramento. So uh, after Cheryl and I enjoyed uh, the 50th anniversary with Jim and Barb yesterday and all their family and friends and the church here, which was awesome, last night we got to have dinner with Amanda and my family in Roseville. And it was really cool because Amanda just won the Miss Colorado pageant. So that's Amanda. That's my niece. I know. Pretty cool. Yeah. I knew her when she was just a little rug rat. So... Uh, yeah, so anyway, she's talking to us about the pageant and all the cool stuff about that and all the work it is. And then this coming summer, there's going to be the Miss USA pageant, and she'll be in that because she'll be representing Colorado. So she's going to be in the Miss USA pageant. Woohoo! I know, big deal. So she's in training, and believe it or not, she's in training for all this stuff. And she's telling us about some of the things she is looking forward to. And, and they're preparing even now for the questions that she'll have at you know, the Miss USA pageant. And one of the questions that the judges are going to ask her is this. Where do you expect to be in five years, or where do you want to be in five years? That's a good question, isn't it? Where do you want to be in five years? What are the desires of your heart? It's another way of expressing that question. Do you have an answer? She has an answer, folks. She's already prepared to tell the judges exactly what she's thinking, where she'll be in five years. Do you have an answer? Do you know the desires of your heart? Do you have a plan to get there? Jesus does. Here's the tricky part. Am I following Jesus' desires, or am I doing my own thing? In Matthew 20, and please open to Matthew 20, Jesus is leaving Jericho. He's got thousands of people following him. And there's two men on the side of the road. And they're blind. So let's see what happens in Matthew 20, starting in verse 29. As they were going out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men were sitting by the road, hearing that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Son of David is a title of the king. They're calling out to the Messiah, the king. The multitude, the crowd, sternly told them to be quiet. Now, this is the word of God, and the spirit of God is being very, very polite here, but you know what mobs are like. They weren't saying, be quiet. They were saying, shut up. You know, Leave them alone, you two be- blind beggars. Leave them alone. They weren't treating them with kindness or love. But they cried out all the more, saying, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And Jesus stopped. And he called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? So this morning, this is where we're starting. And literally, the Holy Spirit and Jesus is looking at your heart and your mind and your life. And he is asking you, What do you want me to do for you? What is the desire of your heart? Where do you want to be in five years? The blind man knew exactly what they wanted. They said to him, Lord, we want our eyes to be open. We want to see. And move with the compassion, Jesus touched their eyes, and immediately they regained their sight and they followed him. They didn't go their way anymore. They went Jesus' way. What had been important to them now fell away, and what was important to Jesus was now important to them. This morning, I want to talk about spiritual growth and the reality of our desires. Your desires and what they truly are in in the root of your heart will determine where you're at in five years. You can say all kinds of nice stuff. But what you truly desire will dictate what you do. And what you do will dictate where you will be in five years. If you do nothing, 
you'll be exactly where you're at right now. Is that good or is that bad? Is it following Jesus? What do you want me to do for you? What do you desire from Jesus? In the journey of a disciple, there's four levels. It's not like climbing a ladder, though, I want to warn you. These four levels of maturity are more circular. And you can be in two at once in the mystery of following Jesus. So it's not like a rank in the military. You don't you know, become a buck private and then a corporal and then a staff sergeant. You, you don't grow through ranks that way in following Jesus. Praise God, right? The only general in the army is Jesus. The rest of us are all his adopted children. But as we grow, there are levels of maturity. And just as a parent recognizes the difference between a baby and a toddler, number one is speed, right? Babies crawl, toddlers run. Big difference. There's the difference between a toddler and a teenager. How much food they eat. Okay? So there's all these differences in levels of maturity. And as we grow in Christ, there are differences in levels of our maturity. And so we're going to recognize what those are in relation to the desires of our heart. It's one thing to talk about actions, but it's another thing to talk about the heart. And as you read the Gospels and you read how Jesus interacted with all people, sinners and saints, right? Jesus always went to the heart of the matter. He didn't stay on the surface dealing with rules and regulations. Are you wearing the right suit of clothes to worship? That's what the Pharisees did. Pharisees dealt with external stuff. And their hearts were absolutely disgustingly evil. So God doesn't care what you wear to worship. A lot of people want to make up rules and regulations about what's right and wrong. God wants to deal with your heart and what your desires are. So this morning, it's all about your heart and your desires. What is the desire of your heart? When Jesus stands before you and he says, what do you want me to do for you? He's talking about the desires of your heart. And when you're a blind man or blind woman, and you cannot give yourself sight, nothing you can do can help yourself, who do you call out to? Well, that's an easy one, isn't it? God. That's level one, folks. Seeking God. When you are drowning in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and you've got no life vest, you've got no life raft, you've got nothing but sharks swimming closer, you're not exactly happy and content, are you? So when you are lost and you know you're lost and you've got no ability to help yourself, you call out to God and he answers you, just like the blind men. And Jesus came and he touched them in their need and he healed them in their need, gave them sight, and they followed him. That's level one. That's exploring God. That's seeking God at an absolute basic primitive level. That's a sinner coming to grips with the fact, I know I'm a sinner. You know, you don't need anybody to come up to you when you're not following Christ to tell you how bad you are. Because For one, you're not going to believe him unless you've come to that point of conviction. The Holy Spirit... God Almighty is the one that convicts people of their sin. No person does that. As a matter of fact, what happens if you're not following Christ, if you're living as a happy sinner, right? You're happy in your sin. Life is good. What happens when a Christian comes up and tells you how bad you are? You sinner, you're living in sin, you're going to go to hell, and you go, get out of here, you nutcase. When you suddenly recognize your sin, and you recognize you're blind, and you recognize there's nothing you can do to help yourself, then what do you do? You call out to God. You start seeking God. That's level one. And God in his grace, in his infinite love, comes to you when you're that broken, needy, hurting, lonely, lost sinner, and he heals you. He meets you where your needs are. And he delights to show you his love. He delights to touch you when everybody else is just telling you to shut up and go away. That's level one. Now, there's something profound about level one that those of us who are Christians, 
and, and if you've been a Christian for a while, you, you can struggle with this. You can be a Christian for 50 years or 80 years and still struggle with this. That's why I said at the beginning, these levels of maturity are not a ladder. You can be a Christian for 50 years, and then at some point in your journey following Jesus, you come to realize there's 2% of your heart that's still sitting on the side of the road like the blind man. You know in your head that Jesus is God, and he died on the cross, and he rose from the dead, and he loves you. You know that. You can preach Sunday school teachers on that. You can, you can lead children's Sunday school classes and vacation Bible schools, and you can know it inside out, and you can quote the verses, but there's 2% of your heart that you suddenly wake up in the middle of the night, and that 2% of that heart suddenly becomes 100% of all you feel, and you despair. Because you realize you're still a sinner. And you can't believe God actually loves you. In your head, you know that he loves all sinners. But that 2% of you that is still dirty and rotten and stinking, festering, right? That 2%, when it's hurting, you doubt. God can't possibly love me. You know what I'm talking about. That's when you need to realize the grace of God breaks in and Jesus comes to you when you're feeling that. And he touches you with his love. And he asks you what you want. What do you want me to do for you? And you can say anything you want you can say, make me see. You can say, heal me. Whatever the desire of your heart is, you can say to him. And in his love, he will meet your need in a way that no human being can. That's level one, folks. That is a sinner knowing they're loved completely, 100% by Almighty God. This is when Zephaniah 317 becomes real. Because it says in Zephaniah 317 that God exalts over us with joyful love. He sings over you. Now, probably the last time any of you were sang over is when you were a tiny baby in your mother's arms. And she sang you to sleep when you were just a baby. Right? That is God's love for you. He holds you in his arms when you're broken and stinky and sinful. And he says, I exult over you. You are my child and I love you. Do you feel it? In your worst moment, that is the grace of God that becomes real and all of a sudden you are that blind man made whole, you can see, and now the most important thing is you beginning to follow Jesus just like those two blind men did. That's level one, folks. Hallelujah! I can see! Let's party, baby! Right? You're excited now. God took you in your mess and he's made you whole. And yes, you don't have any skills. You can't quote any scripture. You've been blind your whole life. You've never read the Bible, right? You don't know how to dress. You don't know how to talk. You don't know how to do anything in the midst of the congregation. You don't know the do's and the don'ts and the rules and the regulations. You don't know how to act and talk like a Christian. But, hey, I know Jesus. He touched me. I'm following him, baby. Right? Are you with me? That's level one. How do we grow to level two? What are the desires that will lead you to grow from level one to level two? Let's look at that. Level two. This is when Jesus says in Mark 1.17, follow me. You follow me. This is a growing disciple where you begin to desire real transformation. I'm not going to live like the way I used to live. I'm going to live like Jesus. I'm going to be transformed by him, by his word, by the Holy Spirit. And now... I actually desire to share him. This is level two. If you have no desire to share Jesus, you're not there yet. This is a grace from God that he gives. When you begin to desire to share 
the power and the truth and the reality and the love of Jesus, now you're at level two. Is that good stuff or what? That's a desire of the heart. It's not a rule and a regulation. Nobody's going to come up to you and go, I'm taking away that one stripe. Nope, I'm demoting you. You don't, you don't follow the rules. You don't desire enough. Nobody's going to gripe and complain at you. You're his, you're his follower. You're his disciple. You're his son or his daughter. Jesus loves you. This is a desire he plants in your heart by his Holy Spirit. So you desire to share him, and you have a growing desire. This is something within your heart that you, you have this urging within you emotionally that you want to be more like Jesus. I don't want to be more like Pastor Steve. That guy loves to speed on the freeway and get speeding tickets. That's a guy, that guy's an idiot. I want to be more like Jesus. Jesus knows what he's doing. Let's follow Jesus. Amen? Amen. So what is the desire of your heart? You can fool yourself. You can't fool Jesus. Jeremiah tells us that the desires of our heart are deceitful. But as we grow in Christ, as we keep our eyes on him, his Holy Spirit begins to work in us and refine us and sanctify us and make us more holy. So if right now in your heart you know there's just a whole lot of sin going on, nobody can see it. It's on the inside, right? You know you need to pray and seek God. You're like the blind man. Lord, you know my heart. You see what's really going on. Help me. Touch my heart. Clean me up. So that he'll give you a desire to grow and be like him. That's level two. Now, what does this actually look like? If you could take a picture of somebody's emotional desires, what would this look like? How could you express this? This is when you have a desire to experience in reality, in your real life, Jesus himself and his values and his desires. I mean, have you ever prayed for that? Jesus, make me experience you completely and all that you value and all that you love and all that you think and all that you feel. Jesus, let me experience you. I don't want to just know you with my head. I want to know you in my heart. I want to know the reality of you, Jesus. I want to dream like you dream. Have you ever prayed that? That's level two, folks. That's a passionate desire to fully experience Jesus. You want to be his true companion. You want to follow him so that his mission is your mission and his values are your values. That's different, isn't it? That's a transformed life. You're no longer doing your thing. You're doing his thing and loving it. Now, at a human level, this is impossible. That'd be my, like me showing up at your house with my motorcycle saying, okay, you're going to jump on this, you're going to get on Infinian Raceway, and you're going to ride this bike like I ride this bike. And you go, you're crazy. I'm not touching that. At a human level, it's impossible Literally, isn't it? For us to think. We can do and think and feel like Jesus. He's God. He's sinless. I, I'm a sinner. Folks, that's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. That's why he, he literally gave us his righteousness. That's why Jesus said, I will abide in you as you abide in me. God's done all this. He's asking us for us to submit our hearts to him, and he'll do the work. That's level two. When you desire, Jesus desires. A guy named William Berry wrote this. He says, we want to know his heart, Jesus' heart, so that we might be so much in love with him. Did you catch that? So much in love with Jesus that nothing, not even our fear of suffering and death, will get in the way of our following him. Nothing gets in the way. That's level two. And this is grace from God. This is undeserved favor that God gives everybody that says to Jesus, when he asks you, what do you want me to do for you? You say, Jesus, let me know you. Let me follow you. Absolutely completely. Let nothing get in the way. He will answer the desire of your heart. He will touch you. 
and bring you into that level, and your life will be changed. You will not be normal. How many of you just want to be normal? Was Jesus normal? He's calling us to be like him. Folks, nobody in this room is ever going to be normal again. Amen, hallelujah. So as we continue to grow in Christ, and he and his grace grows us from blind people sitting on the side of the road into following him and then growing and following him so that we want to know him fully, he blesses us to grow out of level one and level two into level three. Folks, some awesome stuff starts happening here. What is it like when you grow to level three, when Mark 3, 13 to 14 is, is real and Jesus says, be with me. When Jesus picked, he handpicked his 12 apostles. He chose them so that they would be with him 24 hours a day. That's his desire. Jesus' desire is not for you to show up here on a Sunday for an hour. That is not Jesus' desire. He desires you to be his child, his companion, his apostle, with him 24 hours a day, 365. Is that the desire of your heart? That's Jesus' desire. It, it may not be yours right now. But the Holy Spirit will work in you and cause this to happen. Now, when you're walking with Jesus at this level, you know what? You're not bored, folks. You can't possibly ever worship God and be bored. You can't listen to a sermon and be bored. You can't study the Bible and be bored. You can't pray and be bored because your life in Christ is electric with the power of God. Your circumstances can be good or bad. You can be on a ship around Italy that hits a reef and sinks. Happened just a year or two ago, didn't it? So not everything that is a pleasure cruise turns out to be fun. Good days and bad days happen to us all, right? In every circumstance with a level three believer, the cross of Christ is central. This is where in your mind and your heart, the passion of Jesus becomes the desire of your heart. Folks, this is way not normal. You know what the passion of Christ is, don't you? How many of you have seen the movie called The Passion of Christ? Okay, folks, that's the passion of Jesus. When your heart grows to know Jesus and experience him in a much deeper level, then his desires do become your desires. And Jesus prayed in the garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, just a couple of hours before he was arrested, just a couple of hours before he was illegally tried and convicted and sent to the cross. He prayed so passionately and with such emotional pain that his sweat was like drops of blood. And he said, Father, may this pass, may this cup go away. I don't want to go to the cross. Who wants to suffer that agony? Who wants to go to the cross and be nailed through my flesh and have all the sins of every horrible, nasty, evil sinner in the world dumped on me? Who wants that, right? Nobody in their right mind. So Jesus prayed, Father, if it's, your, if it's your will, if it's possible, make this go away. And then he said these words. Not my will, but yours be done. The passion of Jesus was for us to be with him, to go through that suffering, to raise from the dead after suffering the shame and the pain and our sins dumped on him, to go through all of that to bring us to be with him, to give us new life in him. So that for any of his followers who continue to grow in him, continue to follow him, and experience him fully. We will experience even his passions and, and that we will become much more compassionate because the compassion of Jesus for sinners, that he was willing to go to the cross and suffer that pain for sinners, that kind of compassion becomes our compassion. 
And we will no longer look at a homeless person or a needy person or a broken sinner and judge them. We'll see them how Jesus sees them, and we will feel that same pain, that same agony, that same brokenness that Jesus felt hanging on the cross. That's level three desire. That's a level three believer. We experience this in simple ways. When you grow as a believer in Jesus to where every day your desire is to abide in him more than anything else. When we have a strong desire to have the Holy Spirit empower us so that we can serve others and bless them in Jesus' name. When, according to Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, if any of you wants to follow me, let you pick up your cross daily and follow me. We gladly do it. Because we know what that means. That means that every single day I am gladly following Jesus. My desire is to be with him and follow him. And my desire is to crucify every stinking sin I have. Every rotten sin that is deep within my heart. I'm going to crucify it daily. I don't want my sin bothering me or getting in the way. I don't want my sin contaminating my walk with Jesus or hurting anybody else. I'm going to crucify it every day. The cross for a level three Christian is central. Yes, Christ was buried and he rose from the dead, and that's in the past. Yes, that happened, historically accurate truth. But he asks us, commands us, in Luke and Matthew and all the Gospels, he said the same thing. If you want to be my follower, pick up your cross daily and follow me. Put your sin to death every day. Don't play with it. Don't hold on to it. Don't pretend it doesn't exist. Crucify. Follow Jesus. Let his passion be our passion. To reach the lost. So that the power of the gospel of Jesus will transform blind people into seeing people. To transform sinners into saints. That's why Jesus endured all the shame and the pain of the cross. That's a level three desire. As far as it is possible, a level three Christian desires to share in Jesus' passion, his suffering. And this is seen in in 1 Peter 4, verse 13, or Philippians 3.10. But this is out of a growing heart of compassion for Jesus. How do you know you're there? When you feel like Mary did, standing at the foot of the cross. All the disciples but John ran. So John was at the foot of the cross, and the two Marys were there. There were women there and John. But one of the Marys was there, and she was crying at the foot of the cross because her Lord was being killed before her eyes, and she grieved. Do you grieve that Jesus suffered for you? Have you ever cried tears as you considered in your mind and heart how much Jesus went through for you? That's the desires, that's the emotional reality for a maturing believer in Christ. It's not that we have to go around crying and you know ripping our hair out every day. That's not true. But that we come to this level of understanding and acceptance of literally how much Jesus has done for me so that in turn I can do for others. So we grow from level one to level two in the grace of God. And it is a grace. It is an undeserved favor from God to grow to level three. We also grow to level four. In level four, Christ himself is central. Jesus said in John 13 through 16 in those chapters, remain in me. No matter what else happens in this world, remain in me. The church is not a health club we join and then go to once or twice a week for six months and then never go again. 
you do know that people join health clubs in you know, January 1st and, and go two, three times a month or a week, and they do that for a few months, and then once a week, and then once every other week, and then they'll make, keep paying those dues every month, and they never go again. The church is not a health club. It's Jesus. We're his body. The focus of the church is Jesus. We're all about him. So as you continue to grow in your walk with Jesus, the desire of your heart and the central place of your heart and mind become only Jesus. That's level four. And the highest desire you have is that all things be done to the glory of Jesus. Now, we know, and don't we know this, in our sinful flesh, our egos desire glory. We want people to think well of us and speak well of us, and we want our face on the cover of Time magazine or whatever magazine you like. I mean, we'd like to be known and famous and people will, you know, think well of us, and we like that. But when you grow in Christ to, to become a fully mature disciple in Christ, the only person you want glorified is Jesus. So it's not about me. It's about him. That's the desire of a level four believer. And this mature desire is for Jesus to reveal, and this is something he does in his grace and his power, he reveals his triumph, his joy. And we experience the journey of carrying our cross and following Jesus and, and going through everything that we go through from the grave through the resurrection, and we rejoice at being with him. Amen? You don't rejoice in pain. But we rejoice in being with Jesus. That's why the apostles could be arrested and beaten and thrown in jail in a dungeon and sing praise songs. They weren't crazy. They weren't normal. But we're not called to be normal. We're called to be followers of Christ. And so if they come to arrest us because we're Christians and they lock us up, we can sing praise songs. What does this desire look like in a heart? In John 15, 11, he said that he came to give us his joy and that his joy would be made full, made abundant and overflowing in our hearts. Have you ever thought about that? Because this is level four, folks. This is not the happiness we have momentarily when we go to a really fun place. There's all kinds of fun places in this world. This next July... I'm looking forward to going to Monterey, California, and I'm going to experience the motorcycle races that are held at Laguna Seca, and that is a fun-filled experience for me. You might think it's stupid and wasteful and not fun at all, but I love it. Now, there's other places you enjoy going, right? Some of you enjoy fishing, and for you, spending three days on the Delta catching fish is like heaven on earth. Amen? Or going to Disneyland. How many of you enjoy going to Disneyland? Happiest place on earth. Okay, it is fun. It is fun. We can admit it. But it's momentary, isn't it? It is not lasting. As a matter of fact, when you get the bill in the mail later, it's not so pleasant. <laughs> Jesus came to give us his joy. So I want you to contrast fun in Disneyland and Jesus' joy. Let me see if I can make this picture a little clearer for you. Disneyland is finite. God is infinite. Amen? So if the infinite God is going to give you his joy, it is infinite. Walt Disney is not going to give you infinite happiness. There is a limit. Even if you've got a yearly pass, it ends at the end of the year. It's not infinite. Jesus wants to give you his joy, which is, say it with me, infinite, infinite joy from God, pure, holy, unstained by any sin, the joy of Christ Almighty in an infinite measure. Okay, folks, can you contain that joy? No, but he's going to give it to you anyway. And he's going give to give it to you in a way that will bless you. He's not going to drown you in a, uh, 
Niagara Falls amount of it that just drowns you and crushes you with its power and force. He's going to give it to you in a way that blesses you and gives you new life and more life and just springs up out of your heart and blesses other people. The joy is going to spread because it's infinite. Do you see how good level four is? That's the reality of a heart growing in Christ. Of Christ working by his Holy Spirit in you and through you. And maturing you to be complete in Christ. You know what this joy is like? I want to go back to Mary again. At the cross, she was crying. She went to the grave after Jesus was buried. And she's still crying. And then Jesus rose from the dead. And Jesus appeared to her first. And in that instant that she, jo- she saw Jesus resurrected, her joy was made infinite. She had never been happier in her life until that instant she saw Jesus resurrected. That's the desire of a level four heart, to see Jesus face to face, resurrected, that I will be with him. Is that the desire of your heart? This deep maturity and grace from God brings peace and contentment that is not based on our experiences. It's in the reality of Jesus. And that we come to realize, as, as is written in James chapter 117, that every good thing and every perfect gift is from above. And it comes down from the Father of lights. And so that in all of our life, whether we're enduring a shipwreck or a pleasure cruise, Every good thing comes from God. And that the unlimited, infinite joy of Jesus is mine. Because he is mine and I am his. That's how we live. Fully, completely, with no reservation in Christ. There's no hindrance. It is fully Christ abiding in me and me abiding in him. And his power is made manifest in my weakness. And I'm cool with that. Level four believers are like John the Baptist. John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that he will increase. Amen? And Jesus said, who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? John the Baptist. So I don't need to become greater, and I don't want everybody in the world to see my name on the, t- the cover of any magazine, okay? I don't want to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Don't want it. Seriously. And I'm not expecting it, and you know that's real. I mean, pfft, I'm not Colin Kaepernick. But my joy and my focus and my life and my heart are centered on Jesus. So when Jesus stands before me and says, Steve, what can I do for you? Help me know and follow you, Jesus. Just help me know and follow you. Do with me as you will. Not my will, but your will be done. Set your joy free in me, Lord, so that I can bless other people in your name. So as you look at all these desires this morning, do you know where you are? And if you don't know where you're at, you can ask Jesus that. That can be the question you ask. When he says, what can I do for you? He says, Lord, help me understand where I'm at with you. If you're a brand new level, if you're like at that level one stage, if you're beginning your journey with Christ, there's one thing you can do. I mean, other than saying, Lord, I'm following you, like the blind man did. Jesus told everybody and his followers, he said, look, when you begin to follow me, Be baptized. Baptism is a public sign of your private faith in Christ. So if you've never been baptized, you can say yes to Jesus right now by saying, I want to be baptized. So let me know after the service. If you want to be baptized, we'll make that happen. And you can make a public demonstration of your personal faith. That's how we all begin. Level one, following Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, 
I have one simple prayer right now for each one of us. That you, Lord Jesus, will make clear to each one of us where we are at with you, where the desires of our heart are, so that we can be real with you and cry out to you, even like the blind men did, and that you will stop in front of us and that you will touch us exactly where we need your touch so that we might grow in you and follow you and bear your fruit. Lord, it is my prayer that you will help each one of us answer that question. When you ask us, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, help us by your Holy Spirit to recognize whether we're at level one or two or three or four, that you would have your perfect way in our hearts. For your glory, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.